Welcome back to Alliance's Heroes, where heroes in business align. To be part of our super community and find out more about Alliance's, visit www.alliances.com. And that's right, and we're back again. And you know, it just keeps getting better and better and better. We're going to learn a lot of things. You're going to hear one of the one of the words that is probably now found more on the internet than any other word. But before we get started, thank you too for the feedback we had when I had on the co-founder of Oracle. So make sure you all know where to go by now. I hope go to the only place. That's alliances.com, E-L-I-A-N-C-E-S.com to see those past interviews because as you all know, it is the only place where entrepreneurs align and you may have the opportunity to meet many of our heroes that are on our show in person and live. So we have with us today, Chris Yim. He is the co-founder and CEO of Liberty X. And are you ready for this one key word that you hear more than anything else? I think, Chris, it's safe to say more than on the news, more all over the news, online, people starting to talk about it everywhere. He is the co-founder and CEO of Liberty X. That's a Bitcoin on every block. The largest network of, you ready? Bitcoin ATMs. You heard me right. Bitcoin ATMs cashiers and kiosks in the U.S. with well over 20,000 cashiers and 12,000 ATMs across 45 states. And he's just getting started. You can reach him at libertyx.com. All right, Chris, boy, we're just going to have a gazillion questions for you because people are like, what? <laughs> what? I mean, I don't even know where to start because it's just such a such a such a, a a whole new field for a lot of people. So walk us through maybe the first part is is how did you even come up with let's do kiosks for Bitcoin when people are still trying to figure out even what Bitcoin is? Sure. And I think like a lot of startups out there and businesses, it starts from a personal pain point. So in um, late 2013, kind of was just doing, doing some research. Um, I was looking to start a business school at Wharton and I knew I wanted to do a startup. I previously worked in investment banking and, and venture capital, but we really didn't have that aha moment. And that's when I first came across Bitcoin and it just seems so fascinating, like what, what it is. I think today, you know, it, it's been so many different things to people. Uh, for a lot of people, it's a store of value. For some people, it's a speculative asset, medium of exchange. It's just digital money, right? That you can go and transact with. And back then it was even more amorphous, I would say. So the first thing that you try to do is you buy some Bitcoin. And, and back then, really, there was no way to, to do it. Um, li literally, there was a site called Local Bitcoins. It's kind of like Craigslist, where you go um, and you, you reach out and you say you want to buy Bitcoin and it, it matches you with somebody else uh, to coordinate an in-person meetup. <laughs> you hand over money. Uh, they send you the Bitcoin afterwards. And that that was the aha moment for me. I realized that Bitcoin had so much potential, but there had to be a better, more trusted and safe way to do it. So uh, basically after that, um, I, I talked about Bitcoin to everybody that would listen to me. Um, the, the one person that really got it uh, was my, ended up being my co-founder, Kyle. And we looked at all the ways that people transacted what was the most time tested and, and true way to, to build that trust. And, and really the ATM um, came to the forefront, right? It's, it's been around a while. Uh, it's, it's a very, very secure device. Everyone's probably used it at this point in their life. And so our mission at that point was really to work with those types of mediums and get Bitcoin out there so that it was really easy for people to transact and buy it. Because once you have it, right, then you can start tapping into all the potential that really exists out there. How did you place your, where did you place and how did you place your first Bitcoin ATM? I mean, where was it? Yeah, yeah. So as you can imagine, um, it, it's kind of this very, very esoteric topic back in, in 2014. And we're talking about, uh, I want to put a, a Bitcoin ATM. No one knew what we we're talking about. Uh, so really, we're, we're just talking to everybody and anybody. And what we, what we knew is we wanted to have really, really high foot traffic, high visibility, because this was going to be the first one in, in the U.S., and we ended up finding a location in Boston South Station, which is the large train station uh, right in downtown Boston. 
And we actually, all the spots were taken. So we actually had to buy a DVD kiosk, take it out and put our Bitcoin ATM. So one day we kind of did this stealth launch, took it out, dropped this thing in. And from then it's really just been a rocket ship. And I mean, it, I couldn't, I would like to have been a fly on the wall when you had the conversation with them of what you're trying to do. They're like, what, ATM, what, what Bitcoin? We know what ATM <laughs> is, but, but, but that. So um, congratulations. And so then the first one you got, and then you just continue to roll from there, I'm sure. Yeah, we, we learned how difficult hardware was. And so quickly made the, the shift to, to software. What was really encouraging was people were coming from all over the world. People would literally would fly into Logan Airport and they saw there was a Bitcoin ATM there and make it a trip to go try out and be part of history. And so, so we've really been focused on scaling the solution because every, we know everywhere that there are people that want to engage in cryptocurrencies and we just want to have a trusted way for them to do so. And again, you can reach uh, Chris Yim. He is the co-founder and CEO of Liberty X. You can also find where the uh, machines are, you know, the ATMs, cashiers, kiosks, and more by going to libertyx.com. You'll see the link below again, libertyx.com. Uh, but Chris, so like walk us through the difference between someone just using their phone who may not be familiar with Bitcoin versus going to the ATM machine and what does it exactly consist of when they go there? Yeah, so I would say uh, there's really two ways you can buy Bitcoin. One is from the convenience of your home. You link your bank account, you send a wire transfer, and you're able to buy Bitcoin remotely. Um, what, what that means, though, is you have to basically turn over all your information, social security number, link your bank. And in today's day and age, you know, with all the credit bureau hacks and things of that nature, people are a little bit wary. And, you know, anytime there's a new technology, it takes a while for people to get comfortable with it. And so what we found was there was an app opportunity to tap into existing brick and mortar, existing locations that consumers actually trust and prefer to transact. Um, a lot of people actually like going to their bank to take out cash, uh, whether it's from an ATM or from a teller, just because it's something that they're used to. And what we tried to do is really tap into that and see if there was a way to marry the convenience of being able to use an app but also the benefit of working and, and uh, going through legacy trusted systems like ATMs and, and stores. So essentially what you do um, with our application is you, you download it, you create an account, uh, you go through the KYC process that's required to do uh, to offer or sell a Bitcoin or any type of um, money related product. And then you find a location near you. Uh, you give us your Bitcoin address and we essentially create a mobile order similar to if you're going to, you know, buy a latte at Starbucks, you select the location and then you go and make the payment and you pick up the good. The only difference is you're making the payment on the ATM or the cashier, and then the Bitcoin is immediately sent to your wallet. That's fantastic. And what do you see now? I mean, again, you guys have been growing, you have, you know, 12,000, 20,000 of these cashiers and 12,000 ATMs across 45 states. Uh, do you plan on moving into additional states? Do you plan on like, where do you want to take the company the next step? Because it sounds like you've got a strong footprint already. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say, you know, it's, it sounds like a lot, but there's hundreds and thousands, millions of businesses out there. And what, what's been really encouraging is some of the best performing markets are suburbs, are towns that might only have 10,000 people. And these traditionally are the people that have been underserved. But because when you think about launching a new product, right, you go after the big cities. But you know, most of America actually doesn't live in a big city. It lives in a suburban or rural area. And what's great about ATMs is literally the, the groundwork has been done, right? Over decades, ATM operators have gone out, find good top performing locations. They work with local brick and mortar, local business owners. And we're able to really just add new offerings to tap into that and, and offer something that you know might have been a forgotten consumer demographic previously. Incredible. And again, you're watching me, David Kogan, listening and watching, host of the Alliances Hero Show. Make sure that you go to alliances.com. As you all know, E-L-I-A-N-C-S.com. The only place where entrepreneurs align because we have with us today, Chris Yim, co-founder and CEO of Liberty X. That means a Bitcoin on every block, largest network of Bitcoin ATMs, cashiers and kiosks in the U.S., Make sure you go to Liberty X where you'll be able to reach out to him or 
make sure you find the location that's nearest to to us to you i mean and again you were mentioning chris that you know people were flying in all over to go to the station to to to, to use your kiosks and that um and you know where do you see though bitcoin itself going i mean it, it is you know you ask a thousand people you get almost various answers from everyone so how do we how do we sift through everything that's going on of, of Bitcoin. Yeah. And, and to me, actually, that's what makes it really compelling. It's not just one thesis, right? Like there's a lot of different reasons people like or use or transact with Bitcoin. Uh, and first and foremost, I, I think, you know, initially it was a store of value. And what's great about a store of value is literally the longer it's been around, the more people trust it. So, you know, Bitcoin has been around a little over 12 years. Um, it's, it doesn't seem like that long, but in, in that time, it's never been hacked. That That's something that is really important if you're thinking about building a new monetary system, a new technology that people are going to be using. Uh, people compare it to gold, right? So it's a, it's a digital form of gold. Gold is, is probably the best store of value out there. It has a several thousand year lead, <laughs> for better or worse, in terms of trust and, and all that. So I, I think all else equal, Bitcoin, every year that goes by and there's no hack and people use it, it builds that trust and people get more and more comfortable with it. In addition, what we're seeing with interest rate hikes and all the macro things that are going on is people are really looking for a way to have uncorrelated assets. They're looking for ways to generate yield. And I think that's where Bitcoin is really interesting, right? Because it, it, it really is, is not, it's not a business. It doesn't generate cash flows. Um, it's something that's global. Every country, you can transact with, with Bitcoin pretty much. And all you really need is a computer or a phone and the internet, and you can send Bitcoin to anyone anywhere. It really provides this kind of global macro coverage and exposure. Whereas usually if you're invested in stocks um, or a certain business, you might only be limited to a certain geography. So for a lot of people, it gives that, that comfort of having exposure to you know, the world in general and also tapping into something that is, you know, rapidly emerging technology. People these days, you know, they really like investing in the stock market. And you know, a lot of people think about Bitcoin as like a stock where today, you know, everyone's kind of heard about it, but not that many people have it. Right. So if you're able to get in early to a technology, like I think about if you bought a share of the Internet and where the Internet went. Right. Like the, a lot of people are making that kind of parallel. And there's a lot of opportunity also to you know, generate returns and build businesses that way. Can you imagine when you were growing up, like this wasn't even around or anything of that. And now you're in a whole industry leading a way, leading the way to things that weren't even in existence. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a little terrifying. I, I actually feel like I was a little bit late. Um, you know, there, there are people coming out of college now, right. And this is the world that they know. And I'm just very, very envious of, um, you know, having those 10, 15 years back and, and all the stuff that could be done or will be done in the next decade. Now, Besides Bitcoin, there's a gazillion now of these other coins. Every day I'm hearing and seeing more of this different names and that. What uh, what can you share about that? And will will there are there any plans to have other coinage on your system? Yeah, I, I think that's what's really interesting about the space. L literally anybody can create a, a new token um, and you can fork existing tokens. So Bitcoin has a bunch of forks that people basically have copied the code maybe change some of the language. Uh, the challenge is always user adoption, right? It, it's, it's trivial to create something, but to get people to use it and transact with it, I think that that's really the, the challenge. And that's what's been so impressive with, with Bitcoin. Uh, literally, people opted in. They redirected their computers to mine Bitcoin um, you know, for the better part of a decade. And they're actually spending real dollars to, to do it today, right? A lot of places have mining farms and they're taking renewable energies um, or places with low, low electricity to go and support the Bitcoin network and process these transactions. Um, and I, I think that's, that's really great because literally anywhere in the world, you can spin up a node and be part of the network. As far as additional tokens, I, I think this is where there has to be a nice balance. So something like Ethereum that has proven itself, that has a really strong community, a lot of derivative projects, it, it's very interesting. Um, when we think about a liberty is how do we launch products in a way that we can adequately support it and have the right support system um, and all the tools to, to make sure it's a successful experience, right? Because people are going to us, a lot of them are buying for the first time. 
So we just want to be very methodical and make sure we have all the checks in place and tutorials and and and, and all that. And I think Ethereum is, is going to be something that we're going to add shortly. As far as you know, there I think there's tens of thousands of tokens out there. We'll likely never really do that because we're not. I, I don't view us as like an online exchange or like a stock brokerage where they offer everything under the sun. We're a lot more targeted. But of course, we're also, you know, we listen to the feedback of our, our customers and partners. And when, if we see a lot of demand for something, we'll, we'll strongly consider it and, and see if we can roll it out in a safe and trusted manner. Now, Chris, there uh, are definitely some newbies that are on that don't realize is, is you don't have to spend and buy an entire Bitcoin, 50,000, 100,000 or whatever it may be at. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about what it means to buy a fractional part of it on your system? Sure. So the way Bitcoin is designed, you can actually buy up to 100 million at a time, or you can send 100 million. Um, that that's not a practical fraction today, since it's you know less than a penny. But with our platform, you can buy as little as a few dollars, and that that's actually what we see, right? Like when you're trying a new technology, it, it's great that you don't have to spend fifty thousand dollars, right? So I think that would be a huge barrier to entry. A lot of people we see they buy maybe twenty, fifty dollars. Uh, they see it in their wallet literally before they leave the store. They get comfortable. They maybe track the, the price of Bitcoin a little more than they used to. And then they get comfortable and they come back and buy larger and larger amounts. Uh, our platform supports purchases up to $5,000 per day. And what we see is a lot of people, once they get comfortable with it, they, they view this as kind of dollar cost averaging. Bitcoin is a very volatile asset. So if you can time it or you can buy it consistently over time, you'll be able to get uh, probably a better price than if you just uh, YOLO'd and, and bought all at once. Excellent. And Chris, you're an MIT graduate, Wharton graduate. I mean, the most prestigious, some of the most prestigious schools that exist. What did you learn from, what did you learn from school since, it, I mean, you know, schools don't teach you right now, at least not now about, you know, Bitcoin and this whole other industry and stuff. What did you learn from those schools that you've carried over to what you're doing now? Yeah, I, I would say so. I was a chemical engineer at MIT, uh, which is really just generalized problem solving. And I think that the biggest takeaway was just like, you know, being open to tackling like tremendously difficult problems and not really knowing or not. It's, it's, it's less about having pattern recognition and more about just hustle and framework. And I think being an MIT, it was just surrounded by brilliant people that were way, you know, way, way, way smarter than me. So I, I learned that my competitive advantage was really just execution, learning new concepts and figuring out how to deploy them. And, and when Wharton, uh, similarly, you know, a lot of really smart people that already had done something else in their career. Uh, fortunately, that, that's where I met my future co-founder. Um, so it, it was great just to be able to have some experience to talk about and find, you know, uh, serendipitously somebody else that really got it as well. Um, but I, I will say that there's, that world was a little bit challenging. It's a little bit different now, but back when we, I, we, I actually dropped out uh, of Wharton, so didn't didn't graduate. <laughs> I, technically, I have a few more years, I think, to, to go back and officially get the degree. But a lot of the people who go to business school, they go like a very traditional route. Go, they want to do venture capital or private equity. At the time, got a lot of looks. I was like, why are you dropping out to do this? Like, <laughs> why don't you just get a, a safe job? And, and I think that, you know, that, that that's something that really resonated with me. I, I think if you're going to business school now or you're going to college now, it's a totally different world out there, right? It's not guaranteed anymore that you necessarily want to go do four years and do a job that you're going to be doing for your whole career. It, it's probably a really, really different and exciting time to be a, a young graduate these days. Sure. And what was the exact moment, the spark that you said, I have this idea, like that, that specific idea of let's do these machines like where were you what was like how did that come to be yeah so it, that would be a, a coffee shop um in uh west philadelphia <laughs> actually so the transaction where i bought my first bitcoin uh, my co-founder was there i invited him basically he was going to be the muscle in case things went south <laughs> it, it ended up being very very smooth but like right after i saw the bitcoin on my wallet we looked at each other and we we're like there's, there's something here, right? Like it actually went through, but nobody in their right mind is going to go through what we just did. So we need to figure out and brainstorm and, and do all the stuff that, you know, they, they, the frameworks that you learn in, in business school, iterate, test, 
go through the MVP um, and, 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 and repeat to, to see if there's something there. And we were fortunate enough that just by putting an unannounced kiosk right in, in South Station, people were coming from all over. And, and, and really since then, it's been iterating, but we never had to really worry about uh, product market fit, which was uh, looking back a great problem to have. Great. We've got time for one more question. I think it's important because you mentioned about, you know, new college graduates and that type of stuff. What kind of secrets now, knowing what you know, would you share with those that are graduating soon from high school? So, you know, I've got a son, he's graduating very soon from high school and it's like, okay, you got a whole lot of new things that never existed when I was around for graduating. And now that you were at the time weren't around that are now. So what secrets would you share? Yeah, I would say forget the master plan. I would really encourage side projects because that's where you tap into your, you know, your actual real interest. The the school curriculum is pretty regimented, and I think if you're a smart kid and you had the creative spark, you'll you'll do fine. But the side projects are actually where you really develop the skills necessary to run a business or uh, learn about you know certain skills and, and, and interests that you do have that you can really take to the next level. And that's something that you won't get once you get a job. So there's a chance to really develop those interests, pursue them in a relatively risk-free environment, right? Because you can always go to college or you can always get a job, but there's more risk involved at that point. Well, Chris, you definitely look for a better way and are bringing Bitcoin to every block. That's a hero. That's right. Chris Lim, co-founder and CEO of Liberty X. You could reach him by going to libertyx.com, L-I-B-E-R-T-Y-X.com. This has been David Kogan with the Alliance's Hero Show.